lost at sea with little hope of rescue. At number five on our list, surviving a terrifying ocean ordeal. I was viewing heaven from a seat in hell. Steve Callahan began his love affair with the sea when most kids were playing Little League. Sailing had been the big focus of my life since the time I was probably 11 when I first started sailing. By 1977, Callahan was designing and building boats. In September 1981, the 29-year-old successfully sailed from the U.S. to England in one of his custom vessels. I created the Napoleon Solo, which was about the size of your average minivan inside, and uh, set off across the Atlantic. From England, Callahan sailed down the eastern Atlantic to Africa. On January 29, 1982, he departed from the Canary Islands, headed west toward home. The estimated travel time, one month. I really didn't know what would happen. It was, um, it was a real adventure. I figured I'd end up in the Caribbean and start a new stage in my life, but it wasn't quite prepared, I guess, for how it actually turned out. Even under the best circumstances, crossing the Atlantic is no simple task. I took the dangers pretty seriously, and the, the risks were primarily that you would lose the boat through crashing it into the shore someplace, which is actually the greatest danger. The, there's less danger offshore than there is close to the shore, ironically. After six days at sea, Callahan ran into bad weather. Oh, wasn't a lovely day. Uh, too much more than that. I wasn't particularly worried. I had the boat snug down with storm canvas and just sliding along, and about midnight, suddenly, bam, something hit the side of the boat. My presumption was that it was a large sea creature like a whale, which is not unusual. But Steve quickly discovered the damage was irreparable. I knew right away that the boat was basically doomed. The boat was sinking fast as 12-foot waves crashed overhead. Callahan decided to deploy his inflatable life raft. It's like two inner tubes, two big inner tubes, about six feet in diameter, one stacked on the other, glued together. And there's a thin floor across the bottom, about an eighth inch of rubber, and a little tent on the top. Callahan estimated he was 800 miles west of the Canary Islands. Without sails or a motor, he had no choice but to go with the flow. The wind and the current would take me to the Caribbean, which is about 2,000 miles away. And at the speed, the normal the raft would drift. It'd be basically it'd be like getting down on all fours and crawling from Boston to Houston. Callahan hoped he would drift into the nearby transatlantic shipping lanes and be rescued by a passing vessel. I was sitting there going, oh, I'm not going to make it to the shipping lanes just two weeks from now because I don't have enough water and there's no food here. And I, I really thought I was going to die. Callahan collected small amounts of rainwater, but lack of food was a major concern. Fortunately, a group of fish began following the raft. During the day, they would go off to hunt, and then as dusk came, they would all come and surround the raft, and over time, more and more fish would surround the raft. The big fish, called Dorados, became a source of companionship and nourishment. Steve would catch the fish with a small homemade spear. The Dorados also attracted ocean predators, Late one night, Callahan found himself in the middle of a feeding frenzy. All of a sudden, I was dozing off, and the whole raft just got picked up off the ocean. Bam! There was a shark that had just come up underneath, and it had trapped one of the Dorado under the floor. That's what it was going after. And then it came after the raft, and it was like knocking the raft around. Callahan used a fishing spear to defend himself. I just kept jabbing at it, and it finally went away. On March 9th, a little more than a month after Steve left the Canaries, Callahan's father notified the U.S. Coast Guard that his son was missing. But after two weeks of searching, the rescuers gave up. So you're talking, you know, 33,000 square miles or something of, of Atlantic Ocean. So the Coast Guard really is not in a position to go out and look for you, especially in the middle of the Atlantic. Throughout his ordeal, Callahan battled dehydration, sunburn, and saltwater sores, but he didn't lose hope. I kept telling myself, look, there's going to be an end to this. You can see you're making progress. You know that you're making progress. Though I was in pain a lot and frightened a lot, um, I was also, on, on the balance side of that, seeing incredible things and having revelations about myself and my life. 76 days after the start of his odyssey, Callahan finally saw a light on the horizon. On April 21st, 1982, he reached Marie Gallant Island in the West Indies. A group of fishermen spotted the birds circling Callahan's raft and rescued him just off the rocky coast. 
they took me to the hospital. They weren't really sure what to do with me. Callahan's family, who never gave up hope of finding him alive, flew to be with their son. Media from around the globe also came to hear the sailor's incredible story of survival. I was only ha too happy to talk about it. I was able to talk about my experience and to slowly put together something of meaning out of this jumble of events. Since his life-changing journey, Callahan has continued to sail and design. He even came to appreciate the positive side of his nightmare journey. The survival voyage itself allowed me to reappraise my life, reset my priorities, realize that I needed people way more than I thought I did. And I guess to recognize that the hells that we go through, you can choose to be stuck in them, but you can also get beyond them and you can use them as building blocks for the rest of your life. Survivors are people who see a new challenge, see this incredible adversity, and quickly embrace it in a way as part of their life experience. This is the new journey that I'm on, and I'm going to thrive in the face of this adversity. That's exactly what Steve Callahan did. When we return, buried alive two times. So now I'm panicky, now I'm freaking out what I'm gonna do.